Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, good morning for those who are joining us uh, from New York. And even good morning to you, Joe, as well. You're joining us from Florida. Um, so very pleased today to host this webinar with Joe Kalish uh, from Net, Net Davis Research. Joe is the chief global macro strategist at Net Davis Research, and he has almost 30 years of experience in the financial sector and the trading and the economy. So we're going to have a really nice discussion around how Joe is thinking about the macro environment today, the interest rate, inflation. Uh, we're going to be able also to touch on some uh, questions. So uh, the way we're going to do this today is to have Joe, uh, he will introduce what Nate Davis are thinking about uh, in terms of the latest research. And then uh, he's going to share a presentation. Um, and then after that, we're going to be able to take questions from you. And I will have some questions and try to make it interactive as well. Uh, so, Joe, welcome uh, to our webinar that is a collaboration between TFO and Petiol. Just to say, TFO is the wealth manager in the GCC, uh, serving high net worth individuals, affluent, ultra high net worth, with offices in Bahrain and Dubai and in Riyadh. And uh, Petiol is the asset manager based in Zurich, Hong Kong, and uh, New York, and we look after all asset classes, but predominantly, as you know, Joe, we look after private markets, private equity, real estate, and private credit. So welcome, and uh, having uh, you in our webinar is a real pleasure. Thank you, Najee. It's a pleasure to join you and everyone who is on the call. Uh, I, I am going to keep it to a high-level discussion here. We're going to first talk about macro, uh, so what's going on in the economy, uh, what's going on with inflation, the outlook there. Uh, then I'll pivot a little bit more toward markets and we'll we'll talk about uh, what's, what's going on with potential easings and easing cycles and what the implications of that might be. And then we'll touch a little bit on the various markets uh, that that we cover. So I'll, I'll try to go through a little bit on the bond market, a little bit on the stock market, a little bit on commercial real estate. Uh, and, and so we'll, we'll talk, touch on the dollar. And, and so we'll, it'll, it'll be a wide ranging discussion that I think will be of interest to everyone. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start sharing my screen uh, and then we'll so we can see that. And then I'm going to put it into the full screen mode here. Uh, and so hopefully everybody can see that. Um, so I just went over the what I was gonna talk about here. I'm gonna skip over the NDR philosophy just in the interest of time. This is really a markets-based discussion uh, and outlook for the, for the economy, for the macro. So uh, if there are questions about the philosophy, I'm, I'm happy to answer those. Um, this is something that we use. It's, it's a, called a recession watch report. Um, last year, we got close to calling for a recession. We never made the call. We, we had half of these 10 indicators flashing a recession warning. Uh, we're now down to one. <laughs> so we have moved away from the recession call. In fact, I've actually uh, written up that there are 10 indicators as of late that are showing an acceleration of economic activity. Things like the ISM manufacturing and services indicators. Uh, we, we've had some improvement um, in the housing market. Of course, we have stock market making new highs. The credit conditions are, are quite favorable. Um, you know, we've seen improvements in consumer confidence and business confidence. Uh, real disposable personal incomes are increasing. So that, there's just a, a, a wide range of indicators that are actually arguing for economic acceleration in the U.S. Now, it's a little bit different outside the U.S. Data is a little more choppy. It's more of rather than accelerating, it seems more stagnating, but not indicating recession. So I, I'm calling this more of that below trend growth and above target inflation. And you can see we're, we're gonna get some updates, some preliminary updates on the global PMIs today, but you know, we'll get the, the full numbers um, you know, next week. And they're you know, 
in the low 50s. That That's kind of that below trend growth, a little bit stagnant. Unemployment rates are low around the world, but in most economies, they're up from their lows. Uh, so again, that, that's a little bit more symptomatic of that below trend growth. Now let's talk a little bit about inflation. Can we get back to 2% inflation? That's the real key that's in everybody on everybody's minds. I think we can get close without going to recession, uh, but I don't think we can hit the 2% and sustain that level without going through a recession. So here's what uh, I'm looking at. We have a pretty benign view and sanguine view of inflation over the near term. Um, and you can see some of the reasons for that have to do with the continuing improvement that we should see on the shelter side. So a lot of the house price gains that cooled last year, there tends to be a lag effect. Uh, and, and that works its way lower into this year. But then notice it actually starts to rebound the other way. Um, this is something that gets a little bit detailed, but we look at the rents were continuing to decline last week. There was some you know, upside surprise in CPI. Usually there's a very close correlation between this thing called rent and owner's equivalent rent. Uh, but that actually owner's equivalent rent took a big jump. So really strong correlation historically. This could just be some weird seasonality going on in January, which tends to happen a little bit with the CPI data. Um, but if, if the rents are telling us the truer picture, we should be seeing some continued slowing in uh, the inflation rates in the first half of this year and into the uh, maybe into the third quarter. We also see a record amount of uh, multifamily units, apartments that are coming online that are in construction right now. And, and so that should start to weigh on some of the inflation numbers. And our view had been even a couple of years ago that inflation was going to be mostly transitory, but that the definition of transitory was incorrect. It was going to take a year or two. And you can see we have this nice relationship here between this global supply chain pressures index and the OECD area inflation. And it matches up pretty closely. And that downward impulse really starts to play itself out in the first half of this year. And then what do you see? It starts to move the other way again. So I've already pointed out a couple of indicators that are showing a little bit more stabilization in inflation in these inflation trends later in the year. And that feeds into the broader outlook here over the intermediate term. So not so much for this year, but as we get into next year, uh, just before I get to that, I, I, do, I did want to make mention here of what the central banks had done, which I think was pretty important so inflation expectations, as inflation ticked up in 2021 and 2022, inflation expectations started to rise. This is the US over here. This is Europe over here. Uh, and, and you could see that this was the main battle that the central banks have won so far. Notice I haven't said that they won the war, but they won the battle of inflation expectations. In other words, inflation, um, expectations have remained fairly well contained. We only got to about 2.4% in the US. We're down a little bit below 2.2 now. Pre-pandemic, we were around 2%, which was the target. So they did a really good job of keeping inflation expectations from becoming unanchored by having such an aggressive tightening cycle. Uh, and, and same thing is true with Europe and the ECB. We started out low, we, we went to about 2.6, 2.7%, and we've come down about two and a quarter. So again, that we never really became unanchored. And I think that was the main objective of the central banks in becoming very aggressive. But my, my bigger concern has to do with the intermediate term outlook. This is the outlook for the next one, two, three years or so. Uh, 
And it has to do with continuing challenges on the supply side, which is why I say here, we continue to be bedeviled by supply side challenges. On housing, we're short housing around the world. Uh, we're short housing in the US by about one to two and a half million units. Uh, commodities is something I've been talking about for several years. Uh, moving from an age of abundance to an age of scarcity it doesn't mean all commodities are going to be scarce all the time, but we are going to see you know, certain commodities become uh, more challenged due to a lack of investment, uh, due to uh, climate change and extreme weather events and rising geopolitical uncertainty. So I think this has to be part of the mix. Um, number three is getting to be a really, really big uh, feature in my intermediate term analysis is this emphasis on security over efficiency. So not just in terms of defense security, uh, you know, physical security and what we have to spend on, on defense, but uh, cybersecurity, AI security, energy security, or even, uh, you know, the, the new energy security or building that out uh, the new energy infrastructure, the green energy infrastructure, food security, supply chain security, all these securities are done under the political heading of building economic resilience. Now, who is it for building economic resilience, right? That sounds like a great thing. Uh, the problem is, you know, why were supply chains set up the way they were? Why were we building so many items in China? Uh, because it was cheaper to do so. And so if you move that production out of China, uh, you're moving it into a more costly area. So we put it in terms, of, oh, it's friend shoring and you know, we'll, we're bringing a lot of production into Mexico now. We've been doing that for years anyhow, but it's accelerating. Uh, and, and so you're moving away from the lowest cost producer to the next lowest or second lowest or third lowest cost producers. So you're adding some cost, some redundancy to these supply chains, and that, that's going to add and feed into inflation. And then of course, labor markets are tight around the world, and you're looking at unit labor costs on the right-hand side here. And you can see the U.S. is the only major economy that's made significant progress on unit labor costs. And the reason why I focus on unit labor costs, just to refresh everyone, unit labor costs are compensation, less productivity growth. So it, you want to see unit labor costs running around your inflation target of 2% at the major central banks, right? So that's how you can sustain and durably maintain inflation at your target is to have unit labor costs around that target. Now, the, the US, again, is, is the closest. Um, you look at some of these numbers, Canada, UK, Eurozone, I mean, we're, we're looking 6% plus. I mean, this is three times their inflation target. Uh, it, it doesn't seem that we're ready for rate cuts even in the US, much less uh, in Europe um, and the UK and in Canada. So I think this is, the US might be, based on these kind of discussion, might be the first to cut rates, but we'll have to see if, 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 if this trend holds up in the US, but we should start to see some of these other areas begin to roll over. And notice Japan, they have the opposite problem. They're at zero. And they're trying to get up to two. So again, people have been gaming out whether the when the Bank of Japan will start to raise rates, maybe that will take a little bit longer than people think because they don't have unit labor costs uh, moving up to their 2% target. I just want to make a little bit of a mention here about um, this potential first rate cut. Now, I, I've always been in Q2 uh, and, and uh, whether that's in May or June is pretty much of a toss up. 
And if we get that continued progress that I talked about on the inflation front, uh, that will or should allow the Fed uh, and other central banks around the world to you know, begin to pull back on some of their restrictive policy is restrictive at these levels. And what we've seen is in the three months before the first rate cut. So the timing actually matters because most of this movement down in yields happens two to three months before the first rate cut. And, and so you could see we've, yields have always declined going into the first rate cut going back to 1970 in the US. So we've never seen yields back up. Um, and then I have some shaded uh, cases here, which are also pretty decent. And these are what I call non-recessionary easing cycles. So these are easing cycles that are not associated with an economic downturn. And we're still see, you know, pretty decent movements downward. And that's because of the improvement in the inflation story. And this also has implications for equity markets. And one of our rules that I skipped over at the, the beginning is basically don't fight trends in monetary policy. And this helps prove that. And we look at an easing cycles and what's happened to stocks using the S&P 500. And there's only been one easing cycle where stocks actually that declined and that was from the bursting of the tech bubble. Um, and, and we also had you know, the 9-11 the and the recession associated around that. And so that was the only time that we actually saw a decline in equity prices. All these other cases, equities uh, have, have gained and some of the, sometimes in the recessionary cases, equities have recovered. And by the time the easing cycle is done, they're ended up in positive territory. So an easing cycle creates a positive backdrop for risk assets. It's not a guarantee, but it creates a positive backdrop. I did want to share uh, a couple of other things on the financial conditions, monetary conditions side. Um, so one is the improvement in financial stress. So as this indicator falls, that indicates less stress. Indicator rises, indicators, indicates more stress. And you can see it has a mirror image with the S&P 500. So the fact that financial stress has been easing over the last year or so, going back to October of 2022, that's actually been very supportive of risk assets. And, and, and so this is really important. It's a very simple indicator, but it's really important that risk assets do well when financial stress is declining. And you can see the last March, we had the, you know, some of the regional bank concerns and stress went up. And once those subsided, risk assets really have done quite well. I am a little concerned uh, about market liquidity coming up. So we're starting to see reserves being reduced. Most of the unwind of the Fed's balance sheet has come in a little bit more technical language here through a reverse repo facility, which is basically taken up by money market funds. Hasn't really affected the banks yet. And it hasn't really affected bank lending, but it will. As we start to run that reverse repo facility down, and as we get into Q2, where treasury bill issuance really is going to drop, that continued unwind of the balance sheet is going to be felt through reserves. At the same time, we had this special lending facility called the Bank Term Funding Program, that was used for the regional bank problem that I just re referenced, that's gonna start to unwind. And we also have our tax payments in the US in mid April. So that's gonna drain liquidity and we could be facing a government shutdown later in April. So we have a number of things going on in April that are really concerning me from a liquidity standpoint. Again, it just means that the market's gonna have a bit of a hurdle. We're okay for now, but as we get into the April timeframe, I'm a little bit concerned that the liquidity is going to be drained and the market is going to be a little bit more challenged. And if there is going to be a correction this year, that would probably be a very good time to think about having one. All right. I want to um, 
continue on here with the uh, you know, some of my risks. I just mentioned one of them, which is the liquidity risk. I want to mention a couple of others. Uh, one is that the central banks just are a little afraid. They aren't confident enough in that inflation is moving down. We saw a little bit of this again yesterday in the minutes that you know they they want to get more comfortable. They're just not at that level of comfort. And then, as I was discussing earlier, if they don't get underway soon in the first half of this year, um, you know, in as, as you know, no later than summer, it's going to become increasingly difficult for them to ease policy because some of those factors that I mentioned are going to start to fade. And so we could end up, this is, you know, with a real Fed funds rate of around 3%, uh, real, uh, you know, a uh, deposit rate in, the, in, in Europe of around 2%. And that's restrictive. So you could see lingering impacts of that on lending, the cost of capital, uh, and that could really slow economic activity. So this is why the, the Fed and the central bank should probably pull back a little bit. Um, even if they pull back somewhat, they'll still be somewhat restrictive. So we're, we're far from getting to a neutral policy, much less accommodative. Um, but this is the, the fear is that they stay restrictive for too long and it actually does some damage to the economy, but that probably wouldn't be felt till much later in the year or into next year. And then the other thing that uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm going to talk about is the dollar risk. Um, and normally, if the if I have a weak dollar call, which I'll talk about in a second, but if the dollar goes down, normally that pushes import prices up, and that keeps the Fed from achieving its its goals. So they 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 don't seem to play place a lot of emphasis on this. But again, it's just another factor that may prevent them from actually hitting their 2% target. Uh, and just a little bit here, these numbers got updated last week. Uh, this is what the budget deficit in the US looks like. So here's the total budget deficits running you know, five to 6% a year over the next 10 years. So these, these are the updated projections that just came out from the government. And I, I like to look at it by breaking out the net interest portion, which is not something we can really do anything about. We're going to be paying interest on the federal debt and then everything else, which is called the primary budget. Normally, the primary budget should be running around zero. And you can see in the past, that's generally where we have been up until the global financial crisis. And then everything changed. And so we started seeing very big deficits, very big deficits here, very big deficits here. And now, instead of getting back towards zero, we're still in this minus two to minus 3% range. So th that's the hole that needs to be plugged. This should be at zero. And even if this were at zero, we're still talking about three to 4% of GDP is just going to be on net interest. That shouldn't be higher than three. So we have a problem, but nobody seems to care. <laughs> That's the problem. There's nobody in government, whether you're talking Republicans or Democrats, seems to have an interest in reigning in the budget deficit. So who's going to buy all this debt? Look, if inflation comes down, the economy slows, there's going to be plenty of buyers. But what if it's that scenario that I talked about at the beginning? The US economy is accelerating. Maybe inflation stops coming down. Then what happens? This is what happened last year. This is how we got to 5% 10-year treasury yield. We got to a 5% 10-year treasury yield because people were going, whoa, why do I want to buy these things? Yeah, at some point, there's a price, right? At some point, the yield is high enough to say, OK, I'll, I'll buy them. But what's happened is we can't rely on the Fed or the central banks anymore. We can't rely on the banks anymore. We can't rely on state and local governments anymore. It's going to fall on the private sector. So 
that's going to affect the cost of capital throughout the capital structure, right? This is what's going to go on for years. Again, this is a long-term factor. It's not something you need to worry about today, given the backdrop. <clears throat> but having a fair value on the 10-year treasury of around four, three quarters to five and a quarter seems to make sense to me over that longer term. All right, I, I'm just going to skip through a couple of these slides here in the interest of time. Uh, I'm just going to introduce something um, to you that we've been working on. Uh, so we, this is a new report. Uh, it, it's, fun, it's, it's an updated and new report on financial and alternative asset, hour perf asset performance during growth and inflation regimes. And basically, we're in a good regime right now where growth is rising. And I, I tried to argue for that earlier. Inflation is probably more neutral because we're seeing some improvement short term, but there are some challenges over the intermediate term. So let's just call that neutral. That, that's actually a pretty good environment for risk assets. And, and I think that's the key takeaway. So we look at things from a multi-asset view in, in this report. We have other ways of looking at it as well. And, and basically, it says yeah, things like equities should be doing better, which they are. All right. So uh, just, just a quick uh, intro on that. Uh, let's talk a little bit about rates, curve, and credit. I'm a, still a little bit over benchmark duration. I'm a little bit concerned about that because last week I got a new sell signal on the bond market. And so I got a buy signal mid-November. We went all long on that. Now we've got a sell signal here. Uh, we, the market's pretty much gone sideways since that sell signal, but I, I can't stay uh, off of the sell signal for very long. So I, I might be, uh, you know, be, be reducing some of that exposure. And that makes some sense because there's a lot of, you know, uncertainty here. Uh, and I argued that, you know, activity could be accelerating. So there, there could be some short-term problems. Maybe the Fed's not going to start cutting rates until June. So June's a long way off. <laughs> it's four months out. So yeah, I, I may have to adjust for that. But if I think about it on a more theoretical basis, and I'm using maybe a two and three quarter percent inflation swap for this year or inflation by two and three quarter percent, maybe 25 basis points of term premium and a uh, neutral real interest rate of about 60 basis points, that gives me 360. So that, that's why yields should come down. That's why the Fed should cut is, is that on based on where we are with inflation and at risk premium, and uh, you, we, sh we should be able to get to a sub 4% reading. We can't probably get to a sub 3% reading without a real worry about uh, a recession. I'm going to skip the, this, this part here about the curve um, and, and get uh, off of the uh, mortgages. But I, I, I wanted to make mention here, you're know, talking about the positive backdrop for risk assets and credit still continues to hang pretty tough. So if you look at investment grade corporates relative to the U.S. ag, They've been outperforming. They're at or near all-time highs. High yield is at an all-time high. Emerging markets, this is U.S. dollar denominated, is at or near an all-time high. Same thing on the right-hand side of Europe. Investment-grade corporates, just off all-time highs. High yield at all-time highs. Emerging markets <laughs> at all-time highs. So credit's doing just fine. Uh, and, and so... you. Know, there's a, a real reason here to maybe have that continued exposure into, um, into risk assets, including credit. And then this bleeds over, of course, into your world of private credit, right? And so people are looking for opportunities and you know those opportunities are going to be felt in private credit as the banks pull back from some of their lending, but they still have the relationships. And so if you look at some of these private uh, credit companies and you look at firms like Blackstone and, and, and Oak Tree and, uh, and Apollo and, and all those, you know, their stock prices are at or near all-time highs themselves. 
And they're looking for 15% growth per annum over the next five years. And so I do think because of the amount of money chasing these deals, it's going to get a little bit more competitive. Uh, and some of the returns that we have seen in the past are probably not going to be as juicy going forward. There are going to be more defaults. So one of the great things about the last 10, 15, 20 years is that rates have come down. That's made it much easier for companies to outperform, to you know service their debts and, and keep going. As the cost of credit reprices, it's going to be more difficult. Not everybody's going to make it. Some are going to fall off the wagon. So there's still tremendous opportunities out there. Uh, but I think it's just the returns are maybe not going to be quite as what we have seen in the past. So I just, just wanted to make a, a comment on that. Spreads are tight, right? But there are actually good reasons for that. Some of this has to do with the, the shift in the composition of these indexes. And, and, and so, uh, but, but actually investment grade is probably tighter on a relative basis than high yield. But we also are seeing discounted bonds. Now, in places like the US, you want actually want to buy discounted bonds because you get taxed at a lower rate. So there's a real reason for this. And also there's a liquidity premium that with the increasing use of ETFs, liquidity is actually somewhat improved. And so we're seeing this illiquidity premium that you typically would see in corporate debt start to erode as well. So there are some, some reasons for this. And then the loan space, we, we've just moved to a, a uh, a neutral on that. Uh, again, as we remain with yields remaining high, you're still going to get those re those yields. You, it's not until the central banks start cutting that you start to see those returns start to fall off. So no need to, to panic yet on, on loans. Um, just globally, we, we had an underweight on Japan, a slight overweight uh, on, on the UK. Um, but, but the reasons for having the underweight on Japan could be changing. So if we're right that the central banks will eventually, you know, come around to cutting rates, maybe that's in May or June or whatever, you know, there will be an opportunity for yields to decline. And at that point, that might be the real reason to underweight Japan is that we'll get a better return off of our bond positions by buying European and US debt than Japanese debt. And, and, and so it will become less of a call about the BOJ and more about how high yields have gotten in the other developed markets. Um, so let, let's just make, because I'm, 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 I've got a few more slides here and then we'll, we'll stop and open it up. Um, the, this, this slide gets to be a little bit complicated. I'm not going to go through all of it, but basically what it, it, it does is compares the earnings yield from stocks to the corporate bond yield using BAA corporate bond yields in bonds. And, and, and what it basically says is that, yeah, bond yields are slightly higher than earnings yields, but not significantly so. And when you go through the analysis, it still slightly favors equities over bonds. It's not until you get to about 200 basis points of a spread, the equities really start to to, to stumble. So this uh, would at uh, the very least argue for a mild overweight in equities. So there's no reason to, you know, at this point, from a fundamental valuation standpoint, you know, relative value here to worry about, um, about stocks. And as I just went through credit, as long as credit continues to perform well, there's no real reason to worry about credit. So having that, you know, exposure risk assets makes total sense at this point. Um, again, there, there are some things that are concerning. Uh, you know, there are some technical things here that if they don't clear up by next week, you know, we'll start to lose some of the support that we had in this rally off of, you know, October, November, December. Uh, the sentiment has gotten a little bit on the optimistic side. So that's a little bit concerning. Um, but, you know, again, these are short term factors, uh, but may f show up a little bit better in, in April, as I talked about for the liquidity reasons. 
Um, and then just a couple of words here on dollar commodities and, and, and things. Um, and, and so the my big call from uh, October 2022 is that the dollar became extremely overvalued. That was the genesis of that call. It was still now about 5% overvalued. Uh, and so it's, it's, it's working its way down. Um, and, and so, you know, the view is to, that this thing does, doesn't come back to normal, but it actually goes more toward the lower end. That's been the history of, of these uh, swings is they move from an overvalued situation to an undervalued situation. And that's why we've had a general uh, negative view on the dollar. But, you know, you have to be judicious about when you put those trades on. You want to put them on when everybody's bullish a dollar. have gotten much more bullish. Recently, everybody was bearish in January. So you don't want to put them on short dollar positions or weak dollar positions there. And that matters a lot because the dollar has an inverse relationship to gold. And you could see that here. And so a weak dollar should be supportive of gold. The question I've been asking clients is like, why isn't gold at $1,200 an ounce? I mean, you look at this relationship here between real rates, we should be down a lot lower. So the fact that we're up at these levels to me speaks to something else. I think this has to do a lot with geopolitical risks and geopolitical tensions around the world. And a lot of what I would call non-Western aligned economies, not wanting to engage that much in the Western financial system and therefore looking at gold. Um, so the US is exceptionalism, the tech exposure, it's really hard to bet against the US. I think the, big, the real interesting story right now is on China because China has led Pacific X Japan and emerging market indexes lower. But China's doing a lot right now. Uh, it's a really interesting story. If you go look at our rules of research, I mean, fiscal stimulus, monetary stimulus, you know, the government has got your back. It seems like now they're actually doing things about it. Um, and, and so that that's an interesting story. If they can get their economy turned around, uh, that could help out the entire world. And then the last couple of words on commercial real estate, there are you know, brewing problems, uh, growing problems. I think the key chart for me, this one here, shows that we're just not clearing the market. It, distressed sales are minuscule compared to where, where they should be. And when I look at commercial real estate in aggregate, I, it's just not that interesting to me. And when I look at it relative to stocks or relative to bonds, it's just not that appealing. And, and so the, the last slide I'll, I'll, I'll cover here is that you, know, you, you look at CMBS, it may have sh told us that the worst is over in the public markets. And then I look at the stock side. So this is the real estate sector relative to the S&P. And you can see the nice bounce we had in November, December. It gave all that outperformance up, all of it. And so I think we're in the early stages of building a bottom and a base. And so if you're really long-term oriented patient capital, this might be an area to start to think about. Again, the public markets have already discounted this. The private markets have not yet done so. So it's gonna take a year or two to clear out, but if you wanna to start to get involved in the REIT sector, uh, you know, to get involved with some of these cheaper valuations, uh, we, we might, be starting to see the early signs of that in the early stages of that, given the, the improvement that we've seen also in the CMBS market. So, um, Najee, I will stop there. I've got the summary slide on the next uh, page here. I think if I can do that, there we go. But um, let me pause and see if there are questions. I think I went a little bit over, but uh, I, I hopefully got got to a lot of a lot of uh, areas that people were interested in. No, oh, thanks, Drew. Maybe you can uh, stop sharing your screen. I have questions. Yes, uh, that I would yes. like to ask, um, and then we can see if there are questions from the uh, guests. Um, so you spoke about initially about the economic resilience. Um, in in your in your view. Mm -hmm. 
who is the winner today on that economic resilience? So going back to defense, food, safety, what are you seeing? Who is you know, the winner today? In your so the, the winners are going to be other areas of Asia outside of China, and you're seeing tremendous growth in places like India, Vietnam, Indonesia. I mean, these are all benefiting from that movement of supply chains out. And we're also seeing, as I mentioned, you know, Latin America, but particularly Mexico. But there's a lot more production moving out of there. So I really view it as sort of this regional supply chain, like there'll be North America or the Americas, there's a European region and there's an Asian region. So I, that, that's the way I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about it. And so those areas in, in, in particular are, are the ones that I think are going to benefit the most. You, you spoke uh, about overweight equities and, and the, 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 that view, but how do you match this with the valuations on the equity side today that we are seeing? So I, I'm, all, I'm not that worried about the equity valuations because the growth has been there. I mean, what's driving those valuations are these AI stocks. And as we saw with NVIDIA yesterday, I mean, they just continue to deliver. And, and so, you know, the biggest mistake I made in my career is goes back in 1987 when we had the stock market crash and not buying Microsoft because it was quote expensive. <laughs> uh, and, and, you know, if th that's the danger, if you're in a situation like AI, which we think AI is real, but look, at some point it's going to reverse. And, and so the question is, you know, how do you handle that? My answer is you have to be exposed. If you are worried, then buy some out of the money protection like puts to just you know, protect yourself in case the wheels come off the wagon like they did in 2000 and 2001. But to not participate, you really miss uh, underperforming the markets. And so that's the way I, I think about it. But these are all growing companies, earn, companies earning money. These are not companies like on a, some sort of concept. I mean, the, the leaders here, I mean, you know, in, in NVIDIA, Microsoft, uh, Google, I mean, all these are cash flow generating companies. And so, you know, having multiples twice their growth rate is not too unrealistic. Um, if they get, you know, more than that, then you start to get a little bit more concerned. What's your view on commodities and specifically oil? Because you spoke about gold, but I'm curious. Yeah, yeah, so, all of you. so, so, I, you know, I, when I look at, the, the oil picture right now, it's actually kind of interesting because we're in backwardation. Uh, and that does suggest that maybe we're a little bit tight on the supply side. Now, maybe that has to do with the disruption that we've seen to the oil supply chain, uh, where you know a lot of these shipments have to go around Africa now to a, a, a avoid uh, the, the Red Sea. Uh, and, and that, you know, I, I think that's, that's, that's part of the story, you know, accelerating growth is part of the story, but I, I think ultimately it's going to be managed, uh, managed reasonably well. I mean, OPEC plus is doing a pretty decent job of reining in output. Um, and I, I think we're, we should be looking more at a stable oil price. The other uh, point I wanted to make on, on oil longer term is that this whole EV revolution that we're supposed to be going through is really having some second thoughts on the part of consumers. They don't want to be uh, stranded with a dead battery. They, they don't. They want that certainty of supply. Um, and so we're seeing a little bit more maybe in terms of hybrids. And so that waning off of oil and fossil fuels is maybe going to be a little bit slower than everybody thinks it's going to be. And so there are still a lot of challenges that we have on the transportation side, which is where most of this is going to show up. 
um, against the backdrop of increasing demand, as we mentioned in some of those economies like India, um, other areas of Southeast Asia that are going to be continuing to grow and their demand is going to continue to increase. So it, it may not be as desire uh, as 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 awful as as people has had fear, and that's why having more stable price seems to be uh, to me more of, of of where what we should be expecting. Okay, and uh, on election, so between Trump and potentially Biden, how do you see this year's election and? What will this mean to the market? You guys have done tons of research around this topic. Yeah, yeah, we we just gave gave an, an update on it, but let me let me talk a little bit more about forward looking because um, look, it, the election hasn't been decided yet, but um, it's a pretty confusing view. Trump is favored in you know several polls now. The degree is up to debate, but. My concern about another Trump administration is who's going to be captain of the ship. So during the first Trump administration, I had extremely high confidence in his economic team. He had Steve Mnuchin. He had Gary Cohen, who was at Goldman Sachs for many years, and they were the architects of the Trump tax cuts, the COVID plan under Mnuchin. I think they did a pretty good job. They did increase the deficit, which we talked about. But the economy was in pretty good shape. I don't know who's running the ship now. And so people have been, some names have been floated, like Lighthizer, you know, Navarro comes out of prison. I, I mean, are these the people we really want to lead the economy? If it's so, we know what Lighthizer's agenda is. It's trade protectionism. So we're going to see more protectionism. We're going to see more or tougher uh, lines on our allies. I mean, Europe is going to have to spend a lot more on defense. And that's going to be inflationary for them. So... I think this is some of the implications, you know, whether you like the politics or not, the policy implications is what has me concerned about another Trump presidency. And actually, if Biden goes on, I mean, we know what he's doing. He's going to spend more money, um, you know, or try to get more more money for defense spending and, and Ukraine and, and all the things he's been doing have basically been inflationary as well. So. You know, this is why I don't want to be uh, too falling asleep at the inflation risk, because I think they're very present out there. But I, I am worried about who the leadership team is, uh, because, I, I, you know, he had very, very good uh, people around him. And I don't know who those people are next go around. Got it. So I'm conscious of time. Um, maybe I, I share a bit uh, our view on. There is one study we did, which is similar to yours. The last slide you showed was pre-GFC, post-GFC, and then the interest rate, how it went all the way down. And we think that, you know, with inflation, which is not going to get there to zero, is there going to be around 2%? Then we've been reflecting a lot about the real rate environment that we're going to be facing in the next 10 years or 20 years, which is not the same real rate that we've faced in the last 20 years. And um, I think one of the things that we are um, saying is that true that the risk assets are going to benefit because the economies are strong and like you are saying, but I think from a relative value, uh, the returns are going to be minimal, i.e. the expected returns on equity, if we have generated an 8% return over the last 10, 20 years, maybe now it's going to be less than 8 because the real rate of environment and the cost of capital is higher. Um, at the same time, uh, so the expectation of return across liquid and illiquid, in our view, is going to be lower. But at the same time, we think that the uh, illiquidity that is coming from the bank lending, which we think is more of a secular trend, is not something that they will go back and lend, especially on fixed assets, is going to create a bit more a liquidity premium on the type of assets that we do. Like you said, private credit, of course, is not as attractive as it was last year. 
but on a relative basis, it is still attractive. So what we are seeing is like on, a, on an average basis, you have lower return on average, but then you have a higher liquidity premium because of the liquidity that's going to still be around in the system. How, how would you reflect on that from your side? Yeah, so I, I think for the most part that that's correct. Um, we, don't, we, we shouldn't expect uh, equity returns to mimic what we've seen over the last 20 years or so. Um, they, they still can, 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 be, can be positive, but it, it means all the asset classes are going to become a little bit more competitive with each other. Um, and I think one thing that, you know, we, we should think about, Naji, is as, as the population ages, you know, that desire for income is going to increase. And, and so that's going to provide a little bit of a floor on income and income assets. Uh, so there still may be that spread between risk assets and, and more fixed assets as, as the desire to reduce risk um, you know, can, continues. So I, look, I, I think there are going to be opportunities. It's just going to be not as great as what we have seen in the past. And fixed income and income like and cash are going to present some reasonable alternatives for some people that were not really a possibility until what we've seen recently. And, and I think we should be preparing for a more normal environment on real rates. And so when I'm thinking about real rates, I'm thinking about the being between a half and 1%. And maybe even that's too low, but that's where I am now. It's gone are the days where we have, where we could think about negative real rates. And, and so that um, punishment, uh, you know, for, on, on, on savers, that financial repression, if you will, is going to be gone. And, and so this is, you know, why if you look at money market funds, uh, you know, people talk about the six trillion money market funds and, oh, I'll, I'll, that money has to come into risk assets. Not necessarily. Uh, if you're in money market funds, you're earning 5% return. Uh, like, that's good. I don't need to go into risk assets. Now, if the markets crashed and valuations became great and the central banks cut rates to the zero lower bound again or close to it, then, then I got a case. But I, I think the, the opportunities that we're going to have in some of these other asset classes is, is going to make that relative attractiveness compressed. Uh, and, and not as great as it's been uh, historically. And, and again, doesn't mean that it won't outperform, but the degree of outperformance is going to be reduced. Got it. Um, Joe, I have two uh, more questions, but more personal. I mean, I cannot be not asking a question for somebody who has been 30 years in the market and as wise as you, and we know like we get wiser by the year. So the first question is, what has been your uh, major lesson learned that you would share with people around investing? Oh, it's, it's one of our rules. Let your profits run. Cut your losses short. That is the major rule. I mean, again, you could have thought the AI trend recently was overvalued a year ago. And, you know, you would have missed out on all this. And, and so... Locking into trends, and I showed that chart of the U.S. outperformance. That's been going on since 2009. How many times have people said, "Oh, the U.S. You know, the other world's, the rest of the world's going to catch up," and it hasn't. Just like you have to have tremendous discipline. It's hard <laughs> to just let the trends play out, not try to be a hero and pick all the tops and bottoms. If you're nervous, you can do a little bit of tweaking with buying some hedging and, and, and things like that. But I think that's the biggest, the biggest lesson is to you know, get out of things that aren't working and stay in things that are. Very hard to do, but if you look at all the great investors, you look at the Warren Buffetts of the world, that's what they've done. 
you know, they have it slightly different. They say, oh, they're going to buy great companies at fair prices. Okay. But then they stay with them as long as that company continues to do well. And, and that's how you can hold positions for years is that as long as things are going well, there's no reason to disturb the position. And, and I think that's the key, one of the key lessons for investors. And the uh, last question is, uh, if you're coming new in this industry and you don't have this whole experience that you have, what advice would you give the newcomers? Uh, honestly, this is, this is not a do-it-yourself home project. You really should seek out the advice of people who have been doing this um, because it, it, every industry has its nuances and complexities and language um, that is just foreign to most people. It just takes a, a lot of study like any field. Uh, and if you want to avoid those early mistakes, get hooked up with a financial professional that can help guide you in the early stages because the worst mistake you can make is not investing properly in the early stages of your life and therefore having to catch up later in life. And that's a hard lesson for a lot of people to make uh, and to go through. So yeah, if not everybody's in the industry like we are. And so it's just realize, you know, why do you go to a doctor? Because you don't know enough <laughs> yourself. And it's the same thing applies here. Awesome. Thank you so much, Joe. I think uh, we can stay for another hour, you and I, every time we meet. But uh, I think we have to wrap it up. Uh, I hope you guys, uh, everyone who joined us, enjoyed this uh, webinar. There will be a replay. There will be also notes around this webinar, which will be published on both Petiol and TFO website, which you can go through and, and then listen to it again. On this note, we thank you, all of you who have joined. Thanks, Joe, and hope to see you soon.